This is Whiskey Lore. From out of the darkness of unconsciousness, he stirred. He felt his body twisted in an awkward dampness in what felt more like rags than clothes. Sometime earlier, he couldn't quite tell when, he could remember himself praying for mercy as his world drifted into darkness. He knew he was at his end, but a hope overcame him and a rush of beautiful memories streamed out of the dark. The smell of green grass at the farm, his wife Susanna, and the smells that would emanate from the oven as she pulled out fresh baked bread. He even remembered when she would interrupt his morning paper with some menial chore to do around the house, but even that, just for a moment, felt like paradise on earth. Scared to open his eyes, he saw a warm glow and felt the warmth of the sun chasing away the cold. He knew this wasn't heaven, but he wasn't quite sure if he'd escaped hell. The great pains in his sides had a sting of fire. He was pretty sure he wasn't burning in Lucifer's pit. Then the sound of a swallow caught his attention. He began working to clear the cobwebs from his mind. What had happened before unconsciousness was a complete fog. He tilted his body from side to side, hoping to ascertain the situation. He felt a strange stickiness. He was caked in something. And suddenly the fear returned, and he clenched his eyelids together, pinching out any glow of sunlight. Just then, a muffled tone trickled in his ears. He wasn't quite sure what to make of it. Suddenly, he could sense the warmth of the sun removed from his face. A warm hand touched his shoulder. Startled and not thinking, he thrust his eyes open, and there, blocking the bright blue sky, the backlit form of a human face. And all at once, the memories of the terrible event came crashing back to him. Countless savage men attacking him from every direction. The cold steel of a bayonet piercing his skin and riding up deep into his body. In a moment, the steel was removed from his body, and that's when the rush of joyful memories sat juxtaposed to the terror he was gripped with. As the steel punctured again deep into his side, the world had gone black. But rather than screaming, he felt content in seeing the warm smile stretched out on the lips of the man hovering above him. And the only words that came to his mind? He was safe. Now, history is filled with turning points and what-ifs. And for the world of whiskey, there may not have been a greater turning point than on that cool November morning in 1810 in a field near Carthage in County Donegal when a 30-year-old excise man was left for dead but miraculously survived what should have been fatal wounds. He was a man that would long be associated with the downfall of Irish whiskey. But as you will learn over the next few episodes, his impact on the industry would be felt way beyond the perfecting of the still that bears his name. In fact, it would be this particular young man who would help to realize the old undertaker John Bareford's dream of a mighty and successful Irish whiskey industry. Now, scholars have long argued over the origins of the early life of Aeneas Coffey. Was he born in Dublin, where his family resided? Or was he born and raised in Calais, France? Even his education is in dispute, as he is mentioned as having attended Trinity College in Dublin, but no records seem available to prove it. As a 20-year-old, he entered the employ of the excise just three years after the undertaker John Beresford passed away. 
and one wonders if the two had met. For 10 years, Aeneas would build his reputation as a waiter, gauger, and searcher for the king's excise. And he was just the kind of man that Beresford sought for the job, someone who was more than just a tax collector. Beresford wanted men who were fascinated with the art of distilling, men who could see beyond the tricks deployed by crafty distillers spread across the ancient heartland, down to Cork, up to Ulster, and out to Donegal. And in Aeneas, the revenue had found a man who was obsessed with improving what he saw as ancient practices in well need of modernization. And in Beresford's absence, that system in Ireland would need all the great minds it could muster. With the Act of Union in 1800, one would think that all of Ireland, Scotland, England, and Wales were working together under the same system and with the same advantages. However, each country's distillers saw a distinct advantage in the other country's rules, leading to several fights in Parliament over the first decade of the 19th century. In addition, the revenue had not quite settled on the number of times a still could be charged and kept increasing the number to keep up with the undermining of the tax. The Higgs and Steins had a practice of creating shallower and shallower stills to increase their output. But after gaugers caught on and began compensating, the crafty family then added bulbous heads to the stills to sneak out extra spirits beyond the gauged amount. Then laws had to be enacted to stop these large distillers from having more still heads than stills. And all of this overproduction provided cheap spirits that ran smaller legitimate distillers out of business. In fact, in Scotland, the Heggs and Steins owned over half the legal distilleries by 1798. And Ireland wasn't immune from these kinds of practices either especially since one Robert Haig had recently secured the Daughter Bank Distillery in Dublin, and by 1802, he had quickly turned it into the largest spirits producer in a city that was quickly filling up with distillers, distillers that included his in-law, John Jameson, who had taken over the Stein's Bow Street Distillery and then turned the operation over to his son, also named John. And it's very likely that Aeneas would have had a deep knowledge of these distillers and their practices. But turmoil in the Irish distilling industry at that time came more from just those large players taking advantage. Weather was also a concern. After a season of bad crops, a prohibition was put on distilling in 1798 to preserve grain. Then in November of 1799, Nearly two dozen distillers in Dublin made an agreement to halt the distilling of oats, wheat, and unmalted corn, likely to avoid another prohibition, as a drought brought on another shortage of grain. And because of this collusion, whiskey would become scarce, and prices would skyrocket to 15 shilling per gallon. And to the dismay of the Dubliner distillers, their voluntary action didn't quite have the desired effect they'd hoped for, as further drought and famine hit the laboring classes and Parliament passed an extensive ban on malting and distilling, a ban that wouldn't end until January 1st, 1802. And now the large distillers were finding themselves in the fix, especially since taxes on grain were increasing due to the British war with the French. And into this mess, England would send a new chief secretary, Charles Abbott, holding a position just one step below Lord Lieutenant. Appalled by what he saw, he diligently worked to bring Ireland's excise up to English standards. He would rely heavily on John Beresford's notes and would eventually split the customs from the excise board. He would also pick up the mantle of changing laws that would further crush the small rural legitimate distillers. Still licenses would be geared towards large output and taxes were to be due at the point of production. And those capital requirements 
soon pushed these country distillers out of business and into the illicit trade. But if times were tough for the big distillers, they were getting near impossible for the small ones. From the perspective of the rural Irish distiller, the government was forcing them underground against their will. Oh, for Cork, Leinster, Waterford, and Kildare, where grain grew in plentiful supplies, didn't really miss much in the way of profits with the great grain trade with the British Empire. For them, distilling was a luxury that could be avoided. But in the north in Donegal and west in Connacht, transportation made shipping grains more difficult, so whiskey became the only way they could profit off of their crops. If they would be forced out of legal distilling, well, they would have no choice but to go into the black market. And this began stirring an anger and resentment in those communities. And the target of their anger would soon become the excise officers sent to enforce the laws. Adding to this powder keg, large legitimate distillers soon felt the pinch as the price for their spirits soon well exceeded the prices seen in the illicit trade. Every time there was a prohibition on the use of grains or taxes were raised, legal distillers saw their markets dry up, while better quality grains were being used tax-free by the illicit distillers who were already breaking the law and saw no reason to obey grain use prohibitions. A fear of losing their businesses pushed legal distillers to get more action out of the excise officers outside the city. And soon Donegal was overrun with excise officers raiding property, destroying stills, and using the military to flog distillers. If this wasn't bad enough, they'd leave posting fines as high as 60 pounds, which would be more than the tenants could pay, leaving them at the mercy of landlords who were quick to evict them. Seeing their neighbors treated this way created sympathy for the poor rural distiller and a hatred for the excise men. Then in 1809, the UK Parliament created what would become known as the Sugar Bill, a bill that again would prohibit the use of grain. The excise men soon went after abuses of this law by poor rural distillers and the UK government soon became public enemy number one in North and Western Ireland. And it was into this tense situation that Aeneas Coffey was sent in 1810. Recently married to Susanna Loki, Aeneas wasn't interested in punishment. His focus for nine years had largely been built around creating a solid reputation as a man of Irish whiskey's future. He had survived off his menial salary without complaint. But his country-bound compatriots, well, they weren't so thrilled with their compensation. And if an illicit distiller was open to it, many of them would make bargains to keep their stills running as long as they paid off the excise officer. It was estimated that some 850,000 pounds was lost annually through these ill-gotten gains. Since no records exist, it's hard to really know what Aeneas thought of all of this or how aware he was of the mess that he was about to enter. But it wouldn't have been long before Inspector Coffey got a sense of things. As he arrived in Carthage near Culdiff, he was quickly informed about the dangers of traveling alone in the area. It was insisted that he take four of the king's soldiers with him as he completed his duties. As he headed out with the men to find the rumored location of an illicit still, his small group was quickly overtaken by what Aeneas remembered as around 50 rough-and-tumble locals wielding all manner of weapons. They quickly disarmed the four soldiers and stole their caps. They soon turned on Aeneas, beating him severely and then stabbing him multiple times with their bayonets. A bloody Aeneas would be left for dead, and his once-armed guards would be scattered around him. The 
commissioners of the inland excise were appalled and immediately issued a 200 pound reward for any person or persons who turned in the perpetrators within three months. And if one of the men had played a part in the action, but wasn't the instigator, they would be charged, but would be entitled to the reward and an application would be made for their gracious pardon. But the perpetrators were never found and Aeneas would convalesce and would soon be reassigned to a post in Drahada. But even Drahada wasn't the safest place for an excise man at that time. But it was much more safe than out in the wilds of Donegal, where a war was brewing. Now, this wouldn't be the last time the people of Donegal would hear from Aeneas. For a time, his job would take him further and further away from the region, but he would keep tabs on the developments in the area, and he embedded himself more and more into the politics surrounding distilling in the excise, and a near brush with death by his brother-in-law and good friend Daniel Logie would keep him engaged in what would become known as the Pachin Wars. More on that next week on Whiskey Lore. But before I take you along with me on my visit to Bushmills, it's time to check in on our late 19th century traveler buddy, Alfred Barnard and his companions, as they head into Limerick. From Galway to Limerick was one of the most tedious journeys we'd experienced during our lengthened stay in Ireland. The train proceeded for a greater part of the way at a snail's pace through an uninteresting track and to make matters worse, the railway guard kept the train waiting at several locations whilst he imparted the latest political news and gossip to the station master and his clerk. Fortunately, on the nearing of our destination, the scene changed and we were traveling more rapidly through a pleasant country along which the magnificent waters of the Shannon rolled on their way to the sea. This river is not only the largest river in Ireland, but any other island on the globe. It waters 11 counties and is 254 miles in length. Soon the steeples and towers of Limerick came into view, and shortly afterwards we reached the station where we found an omnibus from our hotel waiting for us, to which we speedily transferred ourselves and luggage. After dinner, we sauntered further into the cool of the evening to take stock of our surroundings and to view the famous places connected with this historic city. The history of the old city of Limerick, for many centuries, is full of romance and tragical events. It is the only city that has never been taken by the English. It is called the City of the Violated Treaty, mainly from the following event. General Ginkle invested in it in the year 1691, and after six weeks, failing of success, negotiations for a treaty were set on foot. Amicable intercourse was established, and articles of capitulation signed. The garrisons were to march out with the honors of war. The Roman Catholics of the kingdom were to enjoy every privilege of King Charles II's time, and the Parliament was to be summoned to Ireland. Alas, these stipulations were not fulfilled, and King William's successor enacted far more oppressive laws. The violation of a solemn treaty has hung as a curse on England for nearly two centuries. What miseries, rebellions, cruelties, and midnight murders might have been prevented by these concessions of civil and religious rights, and Ireland today would have been a loyal and happy country. We visited some of the chapels, which were well attended by devout worshippers, male and female, presenting a striking contrast to the weekday services of the English churches, where one only sees, at most, a few women. After which we strolled along the river and then returned to our hotel. The next morning we drove to the distillery by way of the Thomon Bridge and along the banks of the Shannon. On our arrival, we were received by the manager with a hearty welcome 
and conducted over every part of the establishment. This fine old distillery is planted on the banks of the Shannon and just outside the walls of the city. Its origin dates back to the beginning of the century and it stands within a few hundred yards of the Treaty Stone and the celebrated Thoman Bridge, one of six bridges that cross the river. The works and buildings cover upwards of six acres and are built on a very convenient plan so as to work principally by gravitation and there is an inexhaustible supply of water for every purpose. We commenced our inspection at the maltings and barley lofts which form a large building 203 feet long by 103 feet broad and are of the shape and appearance of an old perennial castle having two small inner courtyards, each of which is reached by a stone archway. The lofts used for grain adjoin the maltings. They are situated over a large bonded warehouse and a powerful little engine hoists the grains to these floors at a rate of 10 barrels per minute. The two malting floors, which have three spacious stone steeps, are connected with four kilns. Two of them are in the center and one at each end of the building. Two are floored with perforated Worcester tiles, the others with wire cloth, and all of them are heated by open furnaces. On our way to the mill, we pass through the brew house, which contains four large brewing tanks, tons, and more. The mill is a spacious and lofty building, 50 feet long by 30 feet broad, divided into two separate departments, one for grinding of grain and the other for malt. The former contains four pairs of stones and the latter two. The engine used in the mill is a fine one of 30 horsepower and when necessary can be connected with another of the same size which drives the machinery of the distillery. In both mills, the grist and ground malt are carried by double sets of elevators and hoppers to the upper floors of the mill, thence along a bridge into the grist loft over the mash house to which place we next bend our steps. It is a handsome building containing two large mash tuns with usual stirring gear and draining plated. The underbacks, in connection with these vessels, is placed on the floor of the pump room, which adjoins the brewing house. Ascending a flight of stairs, we inspected the coolers, which form a part of the roof of the mash house, and also the capacious water tanks placed on the floors of the adjoining buildings, and therefore at a higher altitude than the refrigerators. At the suggestion of our guide, we climbed to the platform elevated over the tanks where we gained a splendid view of the Clare Mountains, the counties of Limerick and Tipperary, the windings of the River Shannon, the city side of the Thoman Bridge, including the picturesque King John's Castle, now used as barracks, and the island opposite, where a party of cavalry were exercising. Returning to the main building, we came to the cooling room, which contains four refrigerators of the best and most modern pattern, also two cylindrical condensers, like those at Messrs. John Jameson and Sons. From the outside landing, we observed the worm tub of the wash stills, a vessel 48 feet long, which contains nine copper coils. It is in the open air near the top of the stills, and it joins the safe room to which place we next proceeded. It contains the usual safe, sampling safe, and other appliances. From thence, we went to the pump room containing five sets of three row pumps, three used for warts and cold water, two for faints, and one for feeding the boilers with hot water. At the end of the building, we came to the back house, a spacious open roof gallery, which contains five washbacks, each containing 30,000 gallons with space left for other two in course of construction. The wash chargers are constructed of timber and the intermediate charger of metal, all conveniently placed and of a capacity sufficient for the requirements of the work. Crossing the square, we next entered the still house, a lofty well-lighted structure which contains three copper pot stills, 
One, the wash still, is placed near the steam boilers. The other two, in which the final operations are conducted, are situated near two principal engine houses. They have open furnaces underneath and possess all the latest improvements. One of the last mentioned stills was constructed in 1885 for the manufacture of real Irish whiskey. It may be regarded as a model still embracing every improvement which has suggested itself to its renowned builders, John Miller and Company of Dublin, and during their long experience. In close proximity are the low winds and faints chargers all well grouped and conveniently placed as regards the different stills. The floor under the brewing tanks is reserved for the grains or draft, whether it is conveyed from the mash tuns by means of a broad canvas belt working upon rollers. After inspecting these, we crossed over to the spirit store, a building of neat elevation, 80 feet long by 60 feet broad, across the end of which a gallery has been erected for two large spirit vats. On the floor are various appliances for casking and weighing the whiskey, previous to its being placed in the warehouses. A few yards progress brought us to a range of four large bonded stores, well ventilated and very dry. The brewer is accommodated with a capital dwelling house within the enclosure, also the resident engineer. We next inspected the general and excise offices and then took a peep at the engine house, which contains four steam engines, two of them of 30 horsepower and the others of somewhat less power, also six steam boilers of various capacities and dimensions, and from thence visited the carpenters, engineers, coppersmiths, and brass fitters shops, all of them average 45 feet square and are fitted up with every necessary appliance. Upwards of 70 persons are employed on the premises, many of whom have been attached to the place for a number of years. The whiskey made in this distillery is of good reputation and full-bodied, and is said to possess rapidly maturing qualities. It is designated Pot Still Real Irish Whiskey, and is sold all over the Three Kingdoms, and the annual output is 300,000 gallons. Well, that ride between Glens of Antrim and Bushmills turned out to be quite a wild ride. In some ways, the terrain reminded me of the land east of San Francisco with its lack of trees and endless array of hills. Passed by a car on the road, I watched him for almost 20 minutes as he kept getting further and further away. It was amazing how long I could keep a glimpse of him. I was also astounded that I was keeping my breakfast down as the bumps on the road came fast and furious, warning me constantly to slow down for fear of getting a concussion from bouncing my head on the roof of the car. It had been a lovely drive out of Belfast up the coastal road to Carnlock. I looked to see if I could find the Glens of Antrim distillery project made my way up to a potato factory that's associated with it, and I saw that they were filling up a semi-truck full of products. I decided not to disturb anyone, and instead gawked at the view from the factory parking lot. It sat high on a perch above the surrounding countryside that was phototypical Ireland, sloping gently down to the Irish Sea. Now, beyond all the bumps that I encountered, I also encountered my first and only animal crossing during my entire trip. Rather than the sheep that I expected, it was a farmer moving his cattle from one of his fields to another. Luckily, I'd given myself enough of a good cushion of time to arrive. I mostly planned that cushion because of a big motorbike race that was happening in the area, and I wasn't sure if they might have me cut off at some point during my travels. My destination was the Bush Mills Distillery, and when I arrived in town, I quickly caught a glimpse of the distillery to my right. My appointment was at 10 a.m., so I was a little early and decided to snap some pictures from the large parking lot in front. There wasn't going to be any shortage of photo opportunities on this particular day. I was really curious to learn a little bit more about the history of the distillery in these buildings. 
If you ask a fan of the brand, well, it's surprising how many will blurt out that it is the oldest licensed distillery in the world. Their marketing department has done a great job of spreading that message. But I'd also heard that it wasn't Bushmills license at all, but instead that of a farm that was on this location. I was forward to hearing how the guide would approach that whole concept. Now, there was a man named Mark that met me at the gate and gave me a nice warm greeting with a beautiful day, isn't it? I concurred and he walked me in to the visitor center. And there I was met by the woman that was going to guide me through the distillery. Now, this was a special tour that had been set up through the company. The Bushmills Distillery is now owned by Jose Cuervo, and they're under the same umbrella with Stranahan's in Colorado. And that's how I'd made my connection since I'd been out to Colorado the fall before. This was a bit of an impromptu tour, but I asked my guide if she'd walk me through like I was a normal visitor so I could get the gist of what the normal tourist experienced while getting to throw in a few of my own questions. Now, when Irish Distillers Limited owned all of Irish whiskey and had consolidated down to just the distillery at Middleton and this one at Bushmills, Bushmills stood as the single malt distillery for the entire island, while Middleton handled all the grain and pot still whiskey. My guide said they also used to malt all of their own barley in this location but now it came from the Republic. With those two little bits of information, it was growing clearer and clearer to me that it had been quite a while since there was a true fully Protestant whiskey or fully Catholic whiskey, the way they used to divide it up back in the more political days. We walked past a beautiful copper mash tun that had been sliced in half for demonstration purposes. The thing was massive. She said that they had gotten about 40 years usage out of it before it was replaced by a self-cleaning modern unit. There was a walkway that surrounded it, so I was able to take it in from all directions. She said that they used 10 tons of grist every day and milled the barley on site. Then we walked into the still house where we were hit with that lovely sweet pear smell. There were 10 pot stills in the room with piping running all around. Now, it's one of those rooms that makes it a little tough to get a full view of things. It's kind of tough also to get a good spot to take a representative photo. Since the stills weren't running, I was able to snap plenty of pictures on the way through. She said that over 150,000 visitors walk through this distillery every year. I had to imagine, between Bush Mills, the non-working Jameson distillery on Bow Street, and Middleton that they likely got the lion's share of distillery visitors simply because they were the best-known brands, with maybe Teeling and Tullamore Dew grabbing a few extra. I asked her how most visitors got here. She said that a lot of them get car hires, but there are plenty of tour companies that visit as well. The motorbike race was a good draw, and they actually would get cruise ships in to the nearby town of Portrush. She said that's the way that a lot of French tourists got there. We made our way up to a building that had inside of it a warehouse demonstration. She told me that they had 20 warehouses on site, which kind of surprised me. From a first glance, the footprint of the place seemed quite modest. She said the oldest warehouse only went back to around 1885, Apparently a massive fire had gutted the place. So if you're wishing to see some of the remnants of distilling from the early days, unfortunately you're going to be a little disappointed. I think I was just a little bit. But researching distilleries, you quickly learn that fire was a major problem for any distillery that was open prior to the 20th century. So it's pretty rare to find original buildings that go back much further than, say, the mid-1850s. That's why Woodford Reserves Distillery is such a treasure going back to 1838, and so are many of the jewels of Scotland. As we entered the warehouse, there were three barrels on the floor. I got a chance to sniff inside each one of them. One was an Oloroso sherry butt, then a port pipe, and an ex-bourbon barrel. 
I've always thought that this is an exceptional way to demonstrate the differences of the smells and tastes that a barrel imparts on a whiskey. The first place I experienced this was at Dalwini in the Scottish Highlands, although there, you're in the middle of a historic Dunnage warehouse, basically standing in the dark with all of those smells all around you. That makes it a little harder to tune in to a particular fragrance. This fresher and more open space was much more conducive to finding the appropriate aromas. I noticed a painting on the wall behind the barrel display of two coopers. Apparently Bushmills is one of the few distilleries on the island that has a set of on-site coopers and they were third and fourth generation coopers immortalized in this painting. As I would learn on my trip, that skill is all but lost in Ireland. Then she walked me to a display that showed what each of their whiskies were composed of. The regular Bushmills is a 50-50 grain and barley blend that stands at about five years old. The Blackbush is 80% malt, 20% grain, and aged around eight years in Oloroso Sherry. The 10 was a single malt aged in ex-bourbon and sherry, and the 16 is the one that used the poured pipes as a finishing barrel for nine months. She pointed out that the gift shop is where the malting floors used to be. In other words, always look for those pagodas. In older distilleries, those smoke chimneys were a giveaway that there was once a malting floor in that area. But if you see them on, say, Tullamore Dew's modern building, unfortunately those are just decorations paying homage to the malting past. Now, as we stepped into the bar, I saw one of the most stunning pot stills I'd ever seen. Just like the half mash tun I had seen, it wasn't just a copper color, it had depth and character to it, with amazing details in the rivets and seams. I was told it came from the Coleraine Distillery, which was the second to last distillery that was shut down in Northern Ireland, leaving Bushmills to itself. What a glorious piece of history! And ironic that a former competitor still had been acquired and placed in Bushmills. That wouldn't be the only time I would see that on this trip. Now Mark was in the bar area, and so I thought I'd ask him a little bit more about the history of the place. I also, of course, asked if Bushmills ever spelled whiskey without the E. He said, not that he was aware of, then he said that he liked to tease Scottish visitors by mentioning that the E is for excellence. Nicely played. Now, normally visitors would do their tasting in that particular room, but I had been set up over in the VIP tasting room. I was asked which whiskeys I'd had from the Bushmills lineup, and then given the opportunity to taste some new expressions. The first was the Reserve 12. It was a distillery-only bottle, fruity with tropical fruit, banana, vanilla, and a slight peppery finish. It did have a little bit of that solvent note to it. I was hoping to find something that wouldn't. Well, the next one that I tried was absolutely fascinating. Now, in Ireland, they don't have to stick to using oak barrels, and in this distillery edition, this had been aged in ex-bourbon and sherry and then finished in African acacia wood. It didn't have that fuel note, and it definitely had a perfumey nose, along with espresso chocolate, cinnamon, nutmeg, and a nice little peppery finish. I thought about buying a bottle, but thought, oh, I got a long trip. I don't want to be going home with a million bottles. Unfortunately, though, I was a little disappointed at the end of the trip that I didn't pull the trigger. I also tasted the 16 and 21 year old. My guide joked about how some guy had come in and was bragging that he had mixed his 21 year old with Coke. It's your whiskey, pal. While sipping the whiskey, we got into a conversation about Northern Ireland's history and she said she was from Belfast and that her mother was a midwife during the Troubles. Like Sarah, she showed a real pride in her town. I told her I was headed to Derry the next day and she's like, you're really going to enjoy that. It is a great walking town. Our last stop was in the oldest warehouse on the property, built sometime between 1885 and 1890. There was a lift there, 
there was nothing really upstairs to see. She asked me if I wanted to have my picture taken with the barrels, and I was glad that she did, because I always seemed to forget to ask. That picture ended up on the back of my book. I didn't quite get all the history that I was looking for on this particular journey, but it was still a top-notch experience. I thanked my guide, headed into town, stopped in for some fish and chips in the local shop, and got a meal fit for a king. Then I made my way over to my B&B, and that was just a short walk over to the Giant's Causeway, where I spent the rest of the afternoon. I was in for a relaxing Sunday night, free of whiskey tours, and was going to take Sunday off to boot. Derry was next on my list, and then on to Donegal. What a fantastic week in Northern Ireland, one truly to remember. I'm Drew Hanish, and this is Whiskey Lore. Whiskey Lords a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC. Production stories and research by Drew Hanish. If you want to learn more about Bush Mills and all the other distilleries in Ireland and Northern Ireland, or if you want to plan your own dream vacation visiting Irish whiskey distilleries, grab a copy of my new book, Whiskey Lords Travel Guide to Experiencing Irish Whiskey. It features all the information you need to plan and prepare for an incredible trip to the Emerald Isle including travel tips and full profiles of 27 distilleries and information on 24 more that are on the way. Just head to whiskey-lore.com slash Irish book for a quick link to the Amazon site or visit your favorite bookseller or distillery and ask them to order you a copy. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and until next time, cheers and slánja For show notes, transcripts, and more, head to whiskey-lore.com.